Hello, and welcome back to episode four. It may seem a little odd that we're just now showing you the functional requirements, even though we've already purchased hardware, but I can assure you these documents pre-existed some of the earlier videos. Uh, it's just normally YouTubers don't really get into this kind of stuff. I'm, I'm want to just touch on it here because in the real world you're going to have functional requirements, high level requirements, low level requirements, software requirements for format, software requirements for functionality, and all of that's usually documented in, in a uh, series of process documents. Uh, whether you're working for the FAA or NASA, there's going to be a process and a system of documents in place in order to guarantee you followed the process. This would also normally be formatted in a large uh, text document. Here we're keeping it visual with a PowerPoint uh, kind of presentation. So stage one functionality is to duplicate the original uh, functionality with some minor improvements beyond the fact that we're using all modern computing. So right, we'd have our directional controls forward, left, right, backwards, your process controls of pause, an enhancement for setting the speed and setting the turn rates, and then also some cliff or stair detection and obstacle detection during turns so that we don't smack into things. And then of course we have our action commands, uh, things like fire the, the cannon, and the dump command, which is kind of up in the air because I don't have a trailer yet. Uh, but I have a, a vision of a much more interesting uh, trailer than just the little dump trailer that originally came with this. The stage two functionality would include things like solar power and some sun searching logic. I'll either have an adjustable solar panel angle or you just decide where to park in order to get the solar panel angled toward the sun as, as best you can. We'll add a front camera, which we've already have, uh, but I don't want to start with that on the initial uh, build because we just add extra complexity. And then, of course, maybe battery temperature, power monitoring, those kinds of things. Later on, an inertial measurement unit so that we can get some force readings. Uh, this would help tell you whether or not you're flipped upside down <laughs> or versus sitting on your wheels, or if you're going up a hill and you're getting to an angle that's too dangerous might want to back off or things like that. Same reason we would include a, a tilt sensor. Then of course maybe at the high end if we get to that we'll do LiDAR with terrain scanning and doing your own mapping and so forth. That's way down the road. What I'm most interested in however is the regolith collection and transport trailer uh, that will probably have more than just a single dump command and so we'll probably set that up as either SPI or I squared C Okay, so in the original device, there was a keypad that typed in up to 16 commands. And in our world, we're going to have a command file. So this command file needs a format, some brief way of describing each command. So I'm going to keep it to three letter command codes and up to three digits for the command code count. So in this case, you have forward, its code is FRW, and up to three digits of, in this case, vehicle length, which is the original measure on the device as to what the count was for forward or backwards. Then for left turn, right turn, the original unit of measure was minutes of rotation, like a clock. So 15 minutes would be 90 degrees, 30 minutes would be 180 degrees. And I wanted to enhance this a little bit, have a second mode where you can set the speed and set the turn rate. So if you set the speed or the turn rate uh, to slow by setting a one in, then your vehicle counts, the count for forward and backwards, is in single clicks of the encoder wheel rather than entire vehicle lengths, which I believe is about 16 clicks. So you'll have additional commands, pause, fire the laser, dump the end. We're probably going to have much more complexity to this command set. As far as uh, level two functionality, we want to be able to snap a picture, Give it some sort of sequence number, you know, mission name and timestamp so that the files are different. Then, of course, we have some way of resetting the device and reading various registers. So these are just bits of information. Uh, the left click count from the motors, the right click count, the uptime, the number of times a laser has been fired. We'd also later on have things like uh, a set of flags that tell you what uh, the state of each of the de obstacle detectors are. Things like that. You want to design with expandability in mind. So from that, we have an example command file, which in this case does not do a whole lot, but say, for example, it would FRL, which is fire laser, one pulse, just for the fun of it, why not? Uh, we're then going to wait 10 
tenths of a second, which is also the unit of time in the original device, and a tenth of a second as a unit seems fairly decent. I could also have a higher resolution mode, perhaps, maybe a millisecond instead of tenth of a second. I don't have any functional requirements that allow me uh, require me to do higher resolution timing, so we don't need to add features that we don't really need just because they're easy to add. In the industry, we call that gold plating. <laughs> this command is it uh, fires a laser, it waits a second, and then it goes forward two vehicle lengths, so forward two. Then we're going to change by setting the uh, speed to low speed, one. And then we're going to go forward three more, but in this case, now we're talking three clicks of the encoder rather than three vehicle lengths. And then, of course, we'll set the speed back to, like I said, I, I believe it's 16 is the encoder clicks per vehicle length. Now, once we've moved forward a little bit, we're going to turn to the left 15 degrees, which is, or 15 minutes, which is 90 degrees. And then we're going to do this panorama move of taking a picture, turning right five degrees, take a picture, turn right five degrees, take a picture, etc., etc., until you've managed to take seven pictures from pointing to your left to pointing to your right. So moving on, uh, <laughs> some of the improvements we're going to make we're going to upgrade the primary mission computer. As we mentioned before, it's a Raspberry Pi y, uh, Zero with Wi Fi. And we're going to need four digital output pins for the left and right motor to tell it forward and reverse. So what happens is you get two pins per motor. When one pin is high and one pin is low, you get a left turn. And when it goes the other way, you get a right turn. Uh, rotation, I should say. Instead of driving the motors directly from those outputs, we're going to put in a motor driver board for some isolation and higher uh, power output. I did take a measurement current draw that I've seen when the motor stalled is about 500 milliamps. With two motors, that's a whole amp. So we're getting pretty close to the limit of our power supply. Ideally, we never stall the motors. Of course, we'll need one pin out for the photon canner, which is Canon, which is now an LED laser. Uh, one pin input each for each obstacle or cliff sensor. Uh, one pin out to enable the motor encoders. And then two pins, one for each motor encoder to tell us as each click happens. This motor coder enable was part of the original design and it was so that you didn't have the motor encoder LEDs turned on constantly. Now we don't have enough IO pins and space really to worry about that uh, when it comes to all of the edge detectors. So they're just going to be powered on anytime the system's powered on. But we will go ahead and have the motor encoder enable as a separate pin. That'll allow us to save a little bit of power when we're sitting still. And then we need one pulse width modulation pin for the speaker output, and that's going to require a couple of additional components that we'll get into next. SPI and also I squared C, we're going to bring those out so that we can do all our future expansion of uh, IMU or tilt sensor or uh, more importantly, the, the regolith collection and transport trailer. It, I'm going to do a little bit more research as to which one of those formats I want to use uh, for the trailer. So for now, I'm going to just make sure that they're available. Let's uh, take a quick look at the top view of our mucked up uh, moon track. And we have on the front and the back, we have the cliff detectors. And these are little infrared distance detectors. We're going to point them downward. And then anytime we're moving forward, the front detector should be detecting ground in front of us. And anytime we go backwards, the rear detector should be detecting ground behind us. So we don't go off a cliff, or in my case, the stairs into the next room. And then of course, on each corner, we'll have corner obstacle detectors tell us whether or not we're going to uh, run into something while we're turning. Later on, we'll get to adding a solar cell. It just so happens to fit right about that size. Uh, and then, of course, our front camera that we'll add later on. And, and the reason I'm showing it to you is so you get an idea of, of the level of documentation that really is needed for a real system. And like I said, I think most YouTubers probably do this kind of documentation. They just don't tend to show it. So let's take a look at our proto board layout. These pins up here are the connection to the main board, and it brings out all the various data pins along this row, and then you're able to connect up things here. This is where we're going to put all of our headers uh, for our ribbon cables. So for example, our infrared obstacle detector cliff detector pairs that we have for each corner and the front. Uh, the front one will come off of here, and since it's connected with a ribbon cable, we want these ports or these pins to be in the same order as they are over here. So power, ground, and then signal. Power, ground, or hardwired on this board. 
So here's the signal pin, and that will be drawn up here to pin four. The next one uh, going around the, the board is the I squared C port, which uh, we may or may not use. Uh, the UART, again, maybe we'll use it, so we'll go ahead and populate it with some headers. Uh, the next one along this row is the photon cannon. So similarly, uh, power, ground, and signal, who I think we can drive the laser directly using an active low signal. And then the rest of these are the rest of the corner sensors and such. There's our SPI port. And since we might have multiple devices on the SPI port, uh, we're going to dedicate pin 5 here to be... It, it could be just the dump command. If we were going to completely duplicate the previous functionality, it would just be dump. And you'd have this just this one pin output. Uh, but since I think we're going to have our regolith collector is going to be a little bit more complicated, and we're going to send it a series of commands, uh, we'll probably either make that SPI or I squared C, depending on which one's better at having a long cable between it and the trailer. After that, we have our motor driver board, which again, it's laid out as power, ground, and then four signal wires. So we wanted to lay it out here, similarly, where we could tap into power, ground, and the four signal wires off of this side of the board. So this header is for our motor encoders. It's laid out the way it is on the, the hardware, where it's ground, then uh, enable, and then signal, signal for left and right motor. And then we have our speaker output, which I believe will be somewhere in this general area. Uh, and then within this blue box, we have to implement this circuit of uh, a couple of capacitors and resistors in order to convert the square wave coming in from the PWM output to a sine wave in order to get it to our speaker. I don't know, it's been 40 or 50 times I've tweaked this design just to try and make sure that I get the majority of usage out of the existing I.O. So originally, uh, my laser was going to be pin 5, but not only is pin 5 over the 3.3 volt line rather than the 5 volt line, uh, but it's also right next to our SPI so it was a better choice to put number 5 as the chip select rather than the photon fire. And the reason it's the second one here is based off of the way I think all of these ribbon cables are going to come off of here out to the front. So this will be the front detector. This will be the photon which goes to the front. Then one of these is going to go off to the left, the other one to the right. Another one to the left rear, another to the right rear, and then this one all the way to the back center. So this is, again, I'm sort of laying out the board based off of how I think the physical layout will work within the hardware. And that's going to drive which I.O. pin does which function. And now that we've laid all this out, we can very easily get a system I.O. table. So this system I.O. table tells us everything we need to know about uh, the pins that we're primarily interested in. Uh, so our front cliff detector is on pin 4, it's an input and it's active high, which means uh, the device itself is active low. But since we want the ground to always be in front of us, the active level, meaning I've detected a cliff level, would be that it goes from high to low. Whereas the other detectors are going to remain high until they detect something and then they will go low. So I did it this way because in a previous project I went software first decided which pin would do what function, and then when I got to the hardware, it was really difficult to reroute those pins to where they were in a header all lined up ready to go. So that's why I've done it differently in this task. So that's pretty much it for functional requirements and a, a bit of a documentation as to where we're going with the moon track. And mostly it's meant to help me in uh, ease of development. And in a real project, these are documents that would have to be shared between hardware and software developers and that kind of thing. Anyway, if you like this, give me a thumbs up, subscribe, it doesn't cost you anything. And uh, if you really feel generous, check us out on Patreon. We got really simple $3, $10 levels. And we'll see you next time when we get into some of the software finally. <laughs>